and Chris where he's go are going to start us off. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, <clears throat> very excited to be here and get started today. And I would like to start by picking up on Kim's word presentation because right out the get-go, we're breaking the rules. Um, we're, we're not presenting so much as demonstrating something. This is very much a classroom demonstration. It's something we've neither, neither of us have done before. So it is experimental, and um, we're really hoping to get your feedback to tell us what you think works, what could be better, and so on. Um, be three sections. Section one will be rather quiet, also strange in a presentation. About six minutes, Chris and I will be annotating a digital text, um, a poem of 12 lines. Um, the second six minutes, we'll be engaging with our annotations in front of you, talking about our, uh, why we came to the conclusions we did with the text. And then in the last three minutes, you become the students. And we ask you what we missed, what connections you, that you could see beyond the ones we've made, and so forth. Um, I should also note that what we're about to do here is, is so familiar in literary studies um, as to seem not uh, innovative at all. It's close reading, where you take a poem and you simply engage with the language of that poem, the imagery, the punctuation, the small elements of the poem, and see what you can find just on the poem itself, forgetting about things such as theory and history. Uh, but what makes this today different is that Chris and I will be doing this on a, in a digital space, and we'll be annotating on the same page. And so part of what we're doing here is thinking in the ways in which collaborative annotation can take place, both amongst professors, but also within a wider classroom. So this is just one experiment um, among many. Great. All right, we're going to get started. The silence of six minutes, the strangest moment at a, at a conference you've been at. Isn't Scott, you're going to read the poem a couple of times? That's right, right? that's so, right. Thank you for the reminder. Right. We should get that on the screen. Here we go. Okay. We are going to annotate for five minutes. Right. Well, I mean, it, it's raising questions about family, uh, which is, I, I think, also something maybe signaled even in the title. Um, Aunt Jennifer, um, you know, what was the larger family structure that this uh, character is involved in or invested in? Um, and uh, thinking, I guess, thinking about um, sort of armorials and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, uh. You know, I mean, is, is she is she crafting on Jennifer um, a, a different kind of symbol, um, something that that pushes back against um, right. Uh, so, so these sorts of markers of, of, of family and history and tradition um, is she kind of engaging in a practice that would recreate some of these symbolisms. Yeah, I think there's something fixed in, in heraldic uh, uh, connections to family. And I think maybe that's part of wrapped up in the desire that we're seeing in the speaker here. Yeah. Uh, when we switch to stanza two, we move from the object to the subject. And we move also away from certainty to fluttering. There is this real shift in tone as we move to Aunt Jennifer's finger fluttering through a wall. And I wonder if that wall is the same wall being used to create the screen. Um, find even the ivory needle hard to pull, ivory. I think ties back to the men hunting the tigers, uh, comes from the elephant, has colonial uh, connotations. Uh, the massive weight of uncle's wedding band sits heavily upon Aunt Jennifer's hand. Um, and then this future projection in stanza three, when Aunt is dead. So we move from object to subject to something in between object and subject. It is a subject, but it's a dead person. Um, when Aunt is dead, her terrified hands will lie and I can't help but think that lie, there's a possible pun here. This idea that the hands are lying about a relationship that wasn't solid. That the ring stands in one respect for what a marriage can be. Uh, Till death do us part, in this case it's not. There's nothing uh, unified at all about it. So in some ways the hands are lying about the relationship that has come before. And the word ringed here, again, playing back on the ring itself, but this idea of the ringed ordeals that continue to master her. And finally, in those final two lines, the tigers in the panel that she made will go on prancing, proud and unafraid. And while we teach this in the classroom often, this is how we close read a poem, what we don't often do is show it in action. And I think there's a value in showing students that we're just as vulnerable. We're still figuring it out on the fly. And we might come back to this in two days and have a completely different set of annotations, set of readings. Uh, but there, I think there's real value in showing that middle ground. What we don't often teach our students is how are we reading and how might they learn from how we read. So part of what we're trying to do here is show that. Um, but there's many possibilities here for how this could reach beyond, have students annotate before class, professors look at those annotations and use that to guide part of the lecture. So there's ways in which this experiment could be played out differently. And of course, annotations, especially with equipment like this, can happen live in class now. 
So there's ways in which um, this could be quite flexible for different kinds of pedagogical experiments. How are we doing on time, Lauren? That's it? OK. So we're going to open it to the room. Yeah, I mean, we, we can open it to questions either about this. <laughs>